this text from Luke is rich with so many different things going on in it. I, I told the first service, uh, I think we could preach this text alone for a month. Um, first of all, what's really fascinating, Luke appears to have pulled this story from Mark, Mark being the first of the Gospels, so we encounter the same story in Mark's Gospel. We tend in the tradition, scriptural tradition of the church to call this the, the healing of the Gerasene demoniac. Gerasa was one of ten Greek cities uh, on the southeastern side of the Sea of Galilee. That's why we have swine herds, since you wouldn't have them in Jewish lands, right? Pigs being unclean animals, pork being unedible to the Jews. Um, so, so this is a movement of literally the, the Sea of Galilee and the, the, the going back and forth across it is a move of Jesus from the Jews and Israel uh, into the, these Greek lands, the Gentiles. Um, it predates Paul's own sense of movement of the gospel to the Gentiles. And so, so one of the things that we, uh, oh, for fun historical fact, is 30 miles inland, so either these pigs can run really fast or they've got the geography a little wrong in their storytelling. Um, that said, the land's defined by being, you know, the hinterlands of Garasa. Um, it's closer to Galilee than it is to Garasa. Um, but th so one of the, the contextual backdrops is this movement from clean and unclean that is clearly going on in the, in the play of why a swine herd, what, you know, what is going on. The fact that the man himself is sort of unclean to the people, chained down in these tombs, what I imagine might be like naturally hollowed out caves along the water's edge, right? Because there he was to greet Jesus uh, right away. A, a rich sort of framework to what's going on. We have the, the sense, um, so there has just been a debate in Luke with Jesus saying, do you know who I am? Right? We, we know this question from the Gospels multiple times. Who do the people say I am? Who do you say I am? Who am I? Can we correctly identify Jesus of Nazareth? And do we choose to do that as a, a wandering lunatic? Uh, as uh, one sent by God? Do we do it as the Messiah? Or do we do it as the demon here identifies him as son of the Most High God. So, so there's, there's this, we're introduced, even before we get into this text, at this sort of the interplay and the importance of names. And what are we naming, right? Even the, the playful ambiguity of who's speaking every time Jesus addresses the man. Because no line is developed in the text that tells us, is the man speaking for himself or is the demon speaking as the man? In fact, we might argue the man's identity is lost to this wash of possession. A, a reality that comes to uh, clarity when Jesus says to the demon who knows Jesus' name, so arguably you would say has some power over Jesus. This is how the spiritual world works in ancient times. To know a thing's name is to have power and control over it. The demon knows Jesus' name and still gets on his knees before Jesus and this demon or demon collective personality says, don't torment me. Which just fascinates me because it's unclear even again, is the man wanting not to be torn? Don't mess with the demons. I know how to live with them. Is he who doesn't want to be tormented by being made well, because he's, so many have probably tried to make him well and messed it up, right? Just leave me. 
And, and this is echoed, is it not, in the reaction of the neighborhood, right? So huge, miraculous healing. Let's use a, a fancy word, theophany. The Gospels are interested in varying levels of theophany. This is where we come to realize divine power resides in Jesus. So Jesus demonstrates divine power over wind and waves when he calms the store. Jesus de de demonstrates a different kind of divine power when he feeds the 5,000 with five loaves and a fish. Jesus demonstrates a different kind of divine power when he heals the woman with the flow of blood. Jesus yet now develops another kind of divine power, this power over the spiritual world, right? It's meant to be a major revelation that Jesus is who he's named himself to be, right? I have authority not just because I know I have it, but because I've demonstrated the efficacy of my power in the world, and the people do what with that knowledge? Could you leave us alone? They want him to leave. Get away. We're possessed by fear of the power you have. The text says seized. They were seized with fear. And I think about the way that seized could mean to lock up. Seized could mean to, to lose control of one's natural functions and body. To be seized is to be possessed by this very real fear of Jesus and his healing power. In fact, I'm so convinced there's a sense to which they realize that Jesus' ministry can possess you that when the, the man becomes healed at the end of the text, he wants to go with Jesus. And Jesus, I think, on some level says to him, no, because then you'll just let me possess you. And you need to go figure out who you are now for yourself. What has this story made of you? Because possession is about torn and broken identity. It's about all the other forces in this world telling you who you have to be and Jesus needed this man to find that for himself. Which is a little bit why coming to this text this year and after so much work that I've been doing in varying social work circles around what it means to understand trauma-informed care makes me realize Jesus is knows about trauma-informed care long before we were writing up the four, five, or six elements of what it means to be trauma-informed in our care. And you could, you could Google this idea if the, the frame is, work is new to you. You'll find most, uh, most higher ed, most social uh, services, hospital systems are, are talking about some sense of how we do trauma-informed care now, which has to acknowledge uh, the choice of the individual they have to choose, you know, have a sense of agency in their care. We have to acknowledge the historical and cultural developments of gender and of power and of privilege that are operating in that. We have to recognize the way that trauma holds and clings to us. And so we have to create a safe world where we can even dare to look at these things, right? That's why they don't want to look too closely. I think it's why the demon himself says, I don't, don't send me back to the abyss. It should have been his home, and yet the demon is terrified of the idea of going there. Which cannot help but leave me with that Frederick Nietzsche phrase, if you stare too long into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you. Do we want to be made well? Do we feel that is something even within our power? The crux of that all for me comes together in this, in this sort of nodal point in the story when Jesus says, tell me your name. And the demon says, 
My name is Legion. Now, the text gives us an explanation of that name, right? What does the text say? There were many demons, right? So a Roman legion is between five and 6,000 people, right? So we cannot help but read the Gospels against a Roman backdrop. So on some level, what the demon is confessing here is not a name, but a reality. I'm not one possession. I'm thousands of things possessing this man. There's, there's also the reality, this is what like, gets me going because I love a good play on words, with the idea that perhaps he's possessed by the legion, by the concept of Roman legion. He's possessed by the idea of living your life under the value rubric of Rome in which we build empire with, with, a, with a marrying of military might and commercial power, right? And in that, he's been stripped of his humanity. He is possessed by the way he is a thing in a large machine over which he has no power. I'm also uh, with my wife, a parent of four kids who have working jobs and volunteer jobs and the job that is kids, and I get the fact that some days we're just possessed by the legion of responsibilities nitpicking at us, right? Somebody asked me, this is a little bit embarrassing, someone asked me recently, um, it was happy hour, but it was for the, a catch board responsibility. So it was like happy hour when you're kind of working it. Um, it's the closest I've ever come to going to happy hour socially, I think. And they said, what do you do for fun? And I was like, well, what do you mean? I like preaching. No, but what do you do like for fun, like after work is over? Well, work's never over, right? Because someone will text me or email me or Facebook message me or Instagram message. There's just way too, our, our communication methods are legion, right? And, and then, there's, then there's the part where I say, I believe a, an important part of the church is about getting active in the community. So I believe that part of my job is volunteering in the larger community, whether that be in advocacy work, or whether that be on a board, or whether that be on a school, though it's been a long time since I've had the time to go into school. But I used to do that on Fridays back when I was young and had that kind of energy. But they all start and taking threads of you until you feel lost in this sets of responsibility. And all this is before we even start to talk about what it means to have our life caught up in global pandemic or the systems of racism, the gender dynamics of power in our society. There are so many big system level things going on in our world. I had a, a person ask me, are your kids scared to go to school because of all the school shootings? And I began to realize how many layers of trauma we are carrying unnamed to the point where if Jesus says to any of us, what is your name? It would be fair to say, my name is Legion. For I am possessed and seized by a great many things. I believe in the power of naming our realities. I don't believe it does all the work. It's not a magic spell like once you get the power, then you, can, then you can conquer the problem. But I believe it is important to name our realities and to rename and to rename them so that we are reminded when we're of a want to go out and say, I'm failing because I'm not getting it all done that a significant portion of the reason we're not getting it all done is that we never could. 
and there are a lot of decks stacked against us. To realize, I, I have sat with friends talking about, well, my institution or my church or my agency isn't healthy right now, to which my response authentically is that I haven't seen one that is. Our problems are legion. And we, we have to name that reality before we decide it's me that's broken, it's you that's doing it wrong, it's your church that is caught up in these things. It's your workplace that is dysfunctional and unhealthy. The, the crowds come rushing up to get rid of Jesus because my imagination in the text is every single one of them is possessed by legion. And they've learned to love their own demons. And they don't want Jesus messing with them. Which is why fundamentally over and again in his healing ministry, Jesus asks, do you want to be made well? Because we have to choose. We have to have agency in the healing. It's why when Jesus heals the woman with the flow of blood, it's not enough that he heals her of her, her physical trauma, which happens before we even tell the story when she touches the hem and he could have gone on his way. It's why he feels the need to stop and make ceremony and ritual around the healing because her spirit needs healing too. And the trauma she still carries needs to be healed too. In uh, the General Assembly yesterday, we were, asking, we were being asked these uh, diversity and inclusion questions, half testing that we could use the voting system, um, and half um, trying to get assessments. So there, there was questions about race, there was questions about where we placed ourselves on the theological spectrum, but what really caught me was there was a question about what disabilities do you claim? Like, th do you name, you self-identify as having? And there were like a list of seven. Um, I particularly remember the response of the young adult advisory delegates, the young people of the church, because their responses divided out with the other advisory delegates, missionary advisory, ecumenical advisory, um, theological advisory delegates. Of the 39 young adult advisory delegates on that yesterday that voted, 11 of them claimed a mental health disability. And I, and, and when we got to the other numbers, like full, the commissioners, the others, the, the numbers bore that out. Like it wasn't just the young people claiming mental health disabilities. But I'm struck as we continue to do in my family some storytelling around some of the struggles that we're naming and, and the outpouring of response that has come to us to say, we're dealing with that too. We're dealing with that too. And I realize our problems are legion. That old saying about peeling layers of the onion and recognizing that sometimes it's just you're peeling the same layer off the same onion because it's growing faster than you can peel. Oh, Jesus, do not torment me. It is hard when a significant number of the legion of things that possess us, our society large, are generationally woven into the fabric of our being. It's hard to just stop collectively and point ourselves in a different direction. But we're in that level of need. We're possessed by the powers of Rome. We're possessed by the powers of success and perfection. We're possessed by the powers of don't admit it was too much for you. I have to admit when I got COVID and I couldn't get rid of the cough, it seeped into my brain. Oh, I'm one of the ones that wasn't strong enough to deal with it. 
we are possessed by a great many things. Lonnie Perkins gave me permission to share this story. She wrote me, Lonnie, you may recall, in two weeks we will, or a little over a week, two weeks, week and a half, um, we will come together in a memorial service up in Hidden Springs for her 37-year-old son who took his own life and gather with his three young daughters and his wife and his mom and his dad and his family and, 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 the, and the grief and the challenge of that. She, she wrote and, and she ended what she was writing with the words that continue to haunt and hallow me It takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a village to bury one. It takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to bury one. If our problems are many, then we need just as many resources. Struck again by the the fundamental nature of 12-step groups from which the church needs to learn and learn and learn, in which you come together to say, my addiction, my dysfunction, my sin has greater power in my life than I do. That is fundamentally necessary to name. My problems are legion. But then you ascribe to a higher power that is yet more powerful and the power of the community that makes sure that you know you don't overcome that power alone. It takes a village to bury them. It takes a village to be made whole. I believe it's important that we do the naming. The naming of the cultural and political and power dynamics that have control of our lives. I think it's important to name our own diseases and dysfunctions. I think it's important to get the resources of the professionals that can help us to correctly name those and address those. I also think it is of essential foundational importance that you recognize that you need a community of empowerment to help you daily to walk that walk. And I'm grateful to call you mine. This is the word of the Lord.